Okay, so we are starting this uh, uh, afternoon session with uh, three presentations. We are starting, please. Uh, three presentations. Uh, we start uh, um, with uh, Science as an Open Enterprise uh, from Professor Geoffrey Bolton. I, ask, I kindly ask all the presenters to introduce themselves, uh, saying uh, their role at the beginning. And uh, you have a half an hour, and uh, Abhishek. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Geoffrey Bolton. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. I'm a geologist, and I play with uh, big data. Uh, I also chair the Royal Society. That's the UK National uh, Science Academy. I chair its um, Science Policy Center and also chaired um, the production of a report which is referred to uh, here, and the report was called Science as an Open Enterprise. And uh, with luck, I might even be able to use this device. Uh, it's important to make a very clear distinction. This morning, we talked primarily about ac open access publishing. This is about open data. Open access publishing is an important objective, but if we don't manage to change anything, science will continue. In relation to open data, unless we grapple with the problems and the challenges of open data, then the progress of science will be seriously inhibited. However, the two are really very intimately linked, if you think about it clearly, and I'll suggest later on ways in which that linkage might best be seen. But it's useful to start with a little history. Uh, this gentleman on the top left is Henry Oldenburg. He was a German theologian. He just happened to be the first secretary of the newly created Royal Society in London in the early 1660s. Oldenburg was an inveterate correspondent. He corresponded with what we would now call scientists from all over Europe uh, and had a remarkable collection of letters setting up their ideas and things they had found. And he thought, wouldn't it be a good idea, rather than keeping these private, to publish them? And he persuaded the new society to uh, publish the philosophical transaction, its philosophical transactions, which, were, which was the first and indeed the longest lived, it's still published, scientific journal in the world. And many uh, historians of science regard the advent of these journals as absolutely crucial in underpinning the scientific revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries. But what Oldenburg did was require two things. First of all, letters that he published must be in the vernacular and not in Latin, which of course prior to that almost everything published in what we call science was. And secondly, and absolutely crucially, he required not only that scientists should publish their opinions, but they must publish the data, the information, the evidence on which those published, those opinions were based, and they must be published together in the same issue of the journal. Uh, that's a principle that we, is, is as important now as it was then, because in a sense, what it did was to establish a process that we many of us at least believe, is a process of scientific self-correction. That science corrects itself as long as you make available the evidence which others can scrutinize, uh, potentially uh, recapitulate, uh, and, and, criti and criticize. And he made this splendid statement in the first issue of the journal, encouraging those who would write to him to find out new things, to impart their knowledge to one another, and contribute what they can to the grand design of improving natural knowledge to the universal good of mankind. And of course the large question is the one at the bottom, how do we do that in what is not becoming, but what, what has become a post Gutenberg era where we have massive digital acquisition uh, 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 which has largely replaced the printing press for much, much science. And of course, what we're confronted with is this is this marvelous picture from Delacroix showing this great storm of data. Um, and it's important to recognize that not only does that vast storm of data, the like of which we have never seen, not only does it provide us with opportunities, 
but it also poses major problems to the very principle that Henry Oldenburg enunciated some 450 years ago. Of course, one of the problems with all this data that's arriving is that if we look at the rate at which it's increasing, it's been calculated that if we don't find any new technologies, given the rate of production of data at the moment, then within the decade, the whole Earth's electricity supply will be required to cool the computers. So there's a problem of sustainability and indeed a problem of choice. So what are these challenges, problems and opportunities? Well, firstly is what I've called here closing the concept data gap, maintaining self-correction. Uh, about 35 years ago, I published a paper in Nature with seven hard-won data points in it. Uh, we published the data, we estimated the, estimated the potential errors and uncertainties, we gave full details of the experiment such that others could scrutinize the data, uh, replicate the data where they could in new experiments, add to it, and thereby change the concepts and evolve the concepts that we've developed. We developed. About two years ago, we did a, an analogous experiment in Antarctica, but this time not seven data points, but actually about seven petabytes of data. And I suspect even the generosity of nature would not extend to including seven petabytes. And the problem that we have is how do we make that data available in a way that others could scrutinize what we have done in the way that what we did 35 years ago could be scrutinized? And the answer is it's extremely difficult to do. And I'll talk at some length about why that is so. Indeed, there are many of us who believe that science is currently sleepwalking into a major crisis, and it's a crisis of re replicability. Early last year, there was a paper, both one published in Nature, one in Science, which took the top 50 benchmark papers in the last decade in preclinical oncology, a, a crucial area of, of, me of medical research. And they concluded that no more than 11% of those papers were replicable. And the reason most of them weren't was firstly, they didn't put in the data or didn't refer to a source for the data. Or even though they did, the metadata, the data that permits you to understand how to use the data wasn't present. The details of the equipment and apparatus weren't present. Uh, and the ultimate consequence of that was replicability was, was, was extremely difficult in all but a very few, well, actually impossible, in all but a very few cases. Now, that's an absolutely fundamental issue. If we cannot get at and scrutinize and reuse the data that underpins published, published work, then frankly, the published work is no better than myth. And the view of many of us, adding to the comment made this morning about Peter Medawar, is that actually too much science now is published in a way that ought to be quite unacceptable. Uh, the two, the, 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 the data and the, the evidence and the concept, must be published together. So that's the problem, that we've got to somehow close that gap. The challenge, the opportunity, is I think a very obvious one. How do we exploit this data deluge in ways that are highly are, are productive? And one of the ways, of course, we do that is by, by, by sharing data, which has become a crucial issue. It's interesting that the fields of science in which data sharing is best advanced and is most productive are new fields. Old areas of science find it more difficult. They're, they're bogged down, weighted down by their traditions. Bioinformatics is a classic, whereby um, if you talk to a young student in bioinformatics, it is so utterly self-evident to them that data, data sharing is more individually important for them than keeping their own data and hugging it to their chest. And the consequence is, of course, that uh, this schemes like this, which is the Elixir, Elixir scheme in bioinformatics for sharing data, by having a central hub, a series, of a series of national hubs, and underpinning that with this computing tools, the standards and the training, particularly for young scientists, that's needed to ex exploit this opportunity. And we should be looking at areas like this, which are very much bottom-up driven ideas about how science can, can, can advance most, most, most rapidly uh, in key areas. One, of the, one other important point to make is that there have been many examples in recent years where openness has been proven to be an immensely efficient means of working. Uh, in 2011, early in that year, you might remember, there was a very rare 
gigatoxin strain of E. coli that were uh, uh, out, an outbreak in, in northern Germany in Hamburg. But within three months, openness and co collaboration across many scientific labs across the world meant within three months the toxin strain that was responsible for the human damage was isolated and it was, and it was embedded, or the techniques were embedded, in regional public health responses. So open science is not only uh, crucial to the promotion of science itself, but if it's sufficiently open, it can be immensely efficient in cutting down the time scale for discovery. Of course, there are now enormous numbers of databases that are available in most areas of science. This is an example from the life sciences. Um, th these are a series of life science databases, but these other, other colors show other databases of a, a cognate character. Some of them are geographical GIS-based databases, some are po population databases, um, some are environmental data, but they all have several things in common. They deal with issues which interact between all of those domains. And of course, the key question is, can we link them together? And this area, the, the answer is, yes, we can. Can we link them intelligently? And the answer is, well, not yet. We're all used to putting a series of keywords into Google, uh, I I into the Google website. But actually, what Google can't do is respond to an intelligent question. Uh, and an intelligent question might be, the role of pogo sticks in ne necromancy, tell me how it works. Google can't answer that question, but actually it's been worked on. And if we get to the point where it can be worked on, we can exploit these linked databases in ways that hitherto has been quite impossible. And it will give great depth to the diversity and integrity of, of, of scientific understanding. One of the other things, of course, that's crucial is that data needs to be dynamic. It's a public perception, I hope not shared by you, that data somehow is static. Once you've got it, that's it. Well, actually, it's not true. Most of the r raw data that we get is electronic e voltages, amperages. It's electronic information. And what we then do is utilize algorithms and other correlations to, to translate that into numbers of heartbeats per second, frequency of particular proteins, and so on. And the algorithms and the theories that we use to relate the basic information, which is often electronic, to real information about real phenomena, they change through time. We learn more, and therefore we need to change the data. And what we need to do, of course, is to ensure this data is dynamic. About three quarters of that isn't. It's dead data. It can't change because the computational mechanisms that permit data to be updated simply aren't there. And it's something, again, we have to work on and work on, work on very hard. And the economic implications are enormous. This is a publication from the US of about 18, 18 months ago, uh, and just a, number of, uh, a series of numbers. 600 bucks, $600 would buy you a disc on which you could, uh, you could put all the music that has ever been created and known to the human species. Uh, 250 billion is the amount it's estimated uh, could be the benefit to the European public sector, not private sector, public sector administration uh, on an annual basis, which is more than the GDP of, of, of Greece. Uh, and that, uh, that value, $300 billion, that's the uh, amount that's estimated could accrue to the US health system, that's both private and public, if they were able to use data in the most cost-efficient cost and effective way. So there are big payoffs to those who care only about financial returns. But it's crucial to say that it's not just curating, retrieving, and integrating data. It's also what we do with it. Jim Gray, this guy, is probably the sort of big data guru. I mean, Jim is, is quite a guy. When you read this, it's really rather distressing. When you go and look at what scientists are doing day in and day out in terms of data analysis, it's truly dreadful. We're embarrassed by our data, and it's true. We haven't, either in our training or education or our practice, to a large degree, come to terms with the data world. We're still working in my world of seven data points. Uh, what we tend to do is look for patterns in the data. So I have a theory, I go to a very large database, and if I try hard enough, I can find a distribution that will fit my theory. I'm making a fundamental error. What I should be doing is saying, what are the inherent patterns in this data? 
And actually, the inherent patterns that are there are different from the patterns that you might find if you look, look hard enough. Uh, and we really need to think about how we do this in a much more serious way, and it needs to be integrated in our training to a much greater degree. We also partially report data. A classic example is in clinical trials. You find that clinical trials, which util utilize public subjects, tend, about 75 to 80% of them, are public trials that have positive results. The public trials with negative results are rarely published or rarely have been published. And the consequence is, of course, the relationship between cause and effect in relation to particular medical interventions is distorted. And our view, very simply, is that it's scientific malpractice. It should be banned. But equally, we'd say that the non-publication of the data, together with the concept in the journal, is equally scientific mal malpractice. And who is guilty of scientific malpractice? And the answer is the publishers are guilty, whether they are private publishers or whether, whether, whether they are learned societies. And actually, we are guilty in conniving with them uh, as reviewers and editors. And of course, one of the other things that we don't do very often in large, we don't use the right sort of logic. It's all sort of inferential logic of experimentally based inferential logic, and we need to think in Bayesian terms to a much greater degree. And those of you who don't know that what Bayesian logic is, ask, ask the person next door to you. And of course, the other key issue, which has arisen dramatically in recent years, is that of fraud. This is a headline from The Guardian, which is a serious, sensible, well-trusted uh, British newspaper. Science is broken, they had in, in their headline. It's time to stand up for good science. Uh, the examples are numerous, and they're growing more frequent. Uh, and what is the cause? The cause, the cause, according to The Guardian, of the rewards and pressures that promote extreme behavior and normalize malpractice. In other words, you'll do anything to get a good paper that will get you into nature or science, and get good, 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 good citations. So what are the cures? Well, obviously, saying to young scientists, personal integrity is important, matters, but sometimes it's not strong enough to offset that pressure. A key issue, though, is, is does a system have integrity? And systemic integrity, we would say, is that the data must, on which an idea is based must be open for others to scrutinize uh, and replicate. And indeed, I think I would go further and say peer review needs to be, needs to be open too. If we think of the way in which we're addressing planetary challenges at the moment, these are challenges, climate change, uh, major, major, major <coughs> infections, which are enormously important for our societies and for our fellow citizens. They're important because if we decide that climate change is a significant issue, then the costs to a national exchequer and to personal finances of making major changes are considerable. Uh, and really, it's no longer acceptable that that is done on the say-so of a few of we, uh, we scientists who say, well, this is what's happening, this is what you government should do. Our fellow citizens want to know and should be given the means of knowing. And the question is, how do we give them the means of knowing uh, if the data that underpins these ideas is actually inaccessible to them. Uh, the, in a sense, that's a reflection of the citizen's demand for evidence. Uh, my view is that we scientists are going to have to stop thinking of ourselves as we sometimes do in our worst moments, as a priestly caste. And remember, actually, we're like the guy who mends your motor car tires down the road. We just we fulfill a function in society. We're just, we're just functionaries. We think we're important, and maybe, maybe we are, but actually we're just members of society at the base of it. And of course, the other key int interesting development in recent years is the growth of what's been called citizen science, whereby amateur scientists who may not have had any uh, training in research or training in a particular discipline are becoming involved in major and formal and serious research programs simply because the professionals have found that there is great value if they are to do so. So the astronomers, some of the protein chemists, for example, and many others, environmentalists, have been involved in, in creating programs that have real scientific value but also embrace fellow citizens. And in my view, the 2030 question is, um, can we imagine what the development of, of uh, social media and of the 
interaction that's occurred as a consequence of the availability of electronic instantaneous electronic transmission might mean by 2030 to the business of doing science. It might have stopped being science and just be regarded as the common property of the human species trying to understand itself and the world it lives in. And one fervently hopes that that might, might happen. Here's a marvelous example. This is Tim Gowers, a Fields medalist in mathematics, equivalent to a Nobel Prize in maths. Uh, about four years ago, he put on his blog an unsolved mathematical problem, a problem that had been unsolved for 100 years, because he had some ideas about how it might be solved. And he put those ideas up, and he asked, he just generally asked anyone who reading his blog, did they have any contributions to make? And after about 32 days, 27 people had contributed really substantive contributions, more than 800 contributions. Uh, those contributions were rapidly developed or they were discarded as not being appropriate. One of the most crucial actually came from a secondary school teacher in mathematics from Oregon. And, he, and Tim reckoned that not a, after 32 days, not, had they, not only had they solved a special problem, but actually a rather more profound generalization of the problem. His comment was, it's like driving a car, whilst normal research is like pushing it. And the question is, why don't we do more of it? And the answer, I think, is very simple. They're the criteria for credit and promotion. Prevent us from doing things like this, which are much more difficult to measure, because it's not a paper in nature or, 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 or whatever you like. And the last reason why it's important, why, why this domain is crucial, is because the, the, the more data that relates to us that is in the hands of the state, even though it may be the benign states that currently flourish in Europe, the balance between personal liberty and freedom and state control is an important one that demands, as Voltaire once, once said, um, actually I've forgotten what he said, but it's, it, it boils down to sort of perpetual vigilance, permanent vig vigilance. But there's a problem, and the big problem is that open data of itself has actually got no value. The only way in which it's got value is if it can be communicated, and we call this intelligent openness, and who would, who would not wish to be intelligent? And that is data that, that uh, satisfies these four criteria. Firstly, it should be accessible. You should be able to find it. Secondly, it should be intelligible. You should be able to understand it. Thirdly, it should be accessible. Who is this person? What qualifications do they have? Are they expert in the field or not? And it should be reusable. You should be able to use it again. And our view is that only when those four criteria are, are fulfilled are data properly, properly open. Uh, but it's also important that this, which is the metadata, the data about data, must be audience sensitive. If, let's say, in the domain of climate change, I'm making data available so that my fellow citizens can critically evaluate the evidence on which scientific assertions are based, then that has to be presented in a much more friendly fashion than the data I might make available to my colleagues. The amount of work involved is enormous, if that were required of all of us, let's say who were in receipt of European community funding, science would stop tomorrow because we'd all be doing this very difficult task of making it publicly available. And actually one of the important questions to ask of Nelly Cruz is what do you mean when you say data's got to be open? Because frankly, if it all has to be open so that fellow citizens and others can get it, then as I say, science would stop tomorrow. So there's a real problem. And the other final point is that Important to say to politicians who misunderstand this frequently, scientific data rarely fits into an Excel spreadsheet. Most of it won't and can't. And yet if you look at regulations that are frequently going through our parliaments, they say uh, machine readable data. And in their minds they have Excel, I think. Uh, and it just isn't true. So which data and for what purpose? Well, these are the sort of purposes that I, uh, I, I think uh, are rather crucial. I can just pick, time's getting short, I'll just pick out one or two. There's a dilemma of choice. And the dilemma is if we looked at, if we required all the data that is generated, even all the data that supports publication, if we required all that data to be accessible, then frankly, our systems would silt up tomorrow. Somehow we have to choose which to curate and which not to curate. 
And the question is, how do you know that in 20 years' time you won't have thrown away something valuable? And the answer, of course, is you don't. And of course, at the same time in universities in particular, we have contradictory injunctions. Uh, today, we're getting injunctions to share, collaborate, and disseminate. But equally, there are con injunctions to commercialize. And in too many minds, particularly the minds of rectors, that means guarding your IP and keeping it close to your chest, which actually is a mistake on their part. But there are boundaries to openness. And for us, these are the three key boundaries. Commercial interests are a boundary. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Privacy is a boundary. I mean, it's quite obvious that one of the ways in which the public benefit from the, health from the utilization of health systems data could be enormous. But at the same time, one can mathematically demonstrate that computer, completely anonymized data can't be done. It just cannot be done. In other words, there will be a tangible and finite risk of individual health data becoming accessible to others. And somehow we have to use that increasingly finite resource, which is, which is judgment, to determine where the balance should lie. And safety and security, I mean, there's been a great fuss in the last year, a very interesting fuss about the potential use of um, scientific information for, for terror. Uh, and the, the discussion of that's been very interesting. The key thing is that all those boundaries are fuzzy. They're not very tight. This is a, don't worry borrow about the detail. These are a series of industry sectors. And these colors indicate the extent to which the business model in those sectors benefits from open data and other areas where it benefits entirely from commercial, from, from strictly commercially confidential data. And you can see the pattern is a, is, is a complex one. This is what I call the data management ecology. Uh, and it goes from individual collections of data, the laboratory bench that you or I might, uh, might collect data on, the, the institution, the university, the institute, national data centers, and big international centers. It's interesting to note that many of these big international data databases have arisen from the laboratory bench. Someone's had a clever idea about how to collate and use data. Their colleagues have agreed them, what a good idea, let's do it all together. It becomes national, it becomes international. And so very often you find the databases actually rise up the system like this. It's interesting, it's being suggested that the, the total sum of little science data, which is what you or I might have in our laboratory bench, probably exceeds the total sum of big science data, which means CERN and, uh, and similar enterprises. What is equally clear is there's a massive data loss at this level. That's the level of the, the, individual, the individual institution. I've got a minute and a half, I think. These are the views of young researchers. Let me pick away one or two. These are the ones who are going to do tomorrow's science. And frankly, their views differ from those of us that are as ancient and antiquated as I am. Uh, the view, the, a, a, a common view, is that data is not a private preserve. It is a, it is a, public, it is a public resource. The evidence and the, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the concept must be published together. Um, well, you can read it. Uh, this is an interesting one. Science data should be easy to remix as music is to a DJ. Uh, and all those are really quite important and a crucial one at the bottom, we go back to it, the cost of intelligent openness is an integral part of the cost of doing science. It's not a question of you either pay for the day to be open or you do science. They're all the same thing. You can't separate the two. And these are some essential enabling tools where research is currently going on, where we need more research. And in the, uh, the trials that the commission will undertake over the next two or three years, it's crucial that at the same time they fund, uh, th they fund research in those domains. If we think of the actors in research and what they should be doing, what the key, the key issues for them, uh, the publishers, really, it's the publishing domain is utterly crucial. Freeing up text and data mining also. In my view, the way in which they react to text mining is actually a, a, a tangible obstruction to the doing, the doing, of, the doing of science. Um, the key question for uh, employers, universities, is what responsibility do they have for the knowledge and the data that their institution collates? Well, I'll, I'll move over that. Uh, these are international, uh, European, and, and, and national efforts that are currently going on. This is, this is my argument is that actually the, the bottom-up drive is very powerful, it's very important, and what is crucial for those who have top-down top -down views is they shouldn't determined to do things in a ways that, ways that will be inflexible given the 
indeterminate direction of the bottom-up drive. These are the things that are going to tell us how to do the science in 10 years' time. And this is where uh, our, our rector from Liège and I would differ fundamentally. I would say you could crush the bottom-up if you're not careful, and by doing that you're crushing the future. What should our realizable aspiration be? I think it's pretty simple, and it comes back to the de open data, open access issue. A realizable aspiration, I think, is that all the scientific literature is online, all the data is online, and the two can un interoperate. And of course, that's what you're here for. And just to quote a phrase that we use in relation to devolution, political devolution in Scotland, it's not an event, it's a process. We'll never stop doing this. We're not going to achieve it. It's going to continue. And the important thing now is to realize that we've been doing nothing for the past, I don't know, several decades. And we better catch up, but actually we'll be doing it for the rest of the history of the human species. Thanks very much. We have some time for question now. Who wants actually to comment on the presentation that uh, you have heard? No hands? Go ahead. No, it's not the, not the reuse of data. It's the integration of data. So it, I don't know when the last time you were in a good nightclub. But um, I mean, a, a good DJ will go seamlessly from one, um, one recording to another recording. And the problem at the moment that we have with these, big, these great accumulations of databases, this population of databases, is that they are, they are hard-edged. And mixing them in ways so they can effectively talk to each other is, is potentially doable, but at the moment we're not putting enough effort into doing that because the benefits of doing it are, are actually enormous. Because, uh, for example, if I ask the I mean, if I think of my specialist field, and I want to know everything that is known about the acoustic impedance of sediments. Uh, now, in principle, I could find that out by doing a bit of text mining, which I'm not permitted to do, of course. Uh, and what's more, if we could go a little bit further and have this remixing process, I could actually correlate in creative ways data from this publication and that publication and produce a different sort of synthesis. And I think that what's happening, be partially because of the financial mechanisms that we have, partially because we don't yet know how to do it as well as we should, is that rather than being able to exploit the great three-dimensional depth of scientific knowledge that is there, although we don't have it in our heads, actually we're limited the few things that we do, we can remember, and the few things that come up in a Google search. So you know, I think that there is gold in Glendale Hills and we should be pursuing it. Any other question? <coughs> it relates to the same area because you talked about uh, business case and driving the boundaries of uh, design and reality. So would you think that if you take any science theory to the boundaries, how it can actually be communicated and spread it far? Or how do you think, what is, who, who is the thinking leader? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think keep, to keep referring to the business case, uh, I think, is, a, is something one should be rather wary of. I mean, uh, I take the view that actually one of the values of universities to society, um, which they themselves have lost a sense of, is the I that of the ivory tower. The ivory tower is actually a rather important contribution of a university to society, of thinking unthinkable thoughts. And I think you should be wary about the business case. Politicians and civil servants will interpret that, and business people will interpret that in a particular way. I think if you pose it rather differently, and that is to say, it is, in the, it is in the interests of us as citizens in societies to have as much knowledge at, a, at, a, at our fingertips as we're able to get. Because arguably, I think unarguably, the, the progress of the human species is dependent on knowledge. And I think the, question, the large question is how do we maximize our capacity to be able to understand things in the general case? And we have found out an awful lot in the past 
but th we've tended to find them out in bits and pieces here and there. I mean, arguably you could say that the invention of the scientific disciplines in the last hundred years was a necessary step. Uh, the cosmos was too complicated for us to understand it as a whole, so we invented physics and chemistry and geology and metaphysics, whatever. And that, those were the nuts and bolts. But now we've got to start putting, putting the motor car together again. You know, we have these big global challenges which don't depend on one bit of knowledge, but lots of them. And the issue of integration is an absolutely fundamental issue. So I would say it's the business case is that it is an absolutely fundamental driver for, if you like, human ecology. Because, I mean, it's interesting that we tend to think of, when we talk about ec economics, we think about economics as something that bankers and treasurers do. Well, actually, if you think about the economics of, 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 of coniferous woodland, that actually means the total ecology, how it lives and works. And the human species have a, has an economy which is much bigger than the idea of the monetary economy. And I think we just have, you know, we just have to step back. And if we can't be idealistic, then nobody else will be. So I apologize for having going on at you. But, uh, <laughs> so one has, uh, uh, I just want to make a comment. You spoke about uh, intelligent openness. So I completely agree with you that, uh, uh, let's say, um, sharing uh, is not, does not necessarily mean uh, retrieving information. It means also to be able to understand that information and to use that information. Mm -hmm. Now, at least my experience is that uh, once you share uh, data, uh, so when the scientists share data, this is not enough uh, if they do not have the software tool uh, for analyzing the data. So um, I was wondering if it's part of the big vision. For example, the European Commission uh, is pushing a lot of emphasis in uh, sharing data, but uh, is not saying uh, a lot yet yeah. on uh, sharing software. Yes, I, I mean, I think, I'm not sure it's a question of sharing software. Uh, I think it's a question of, because what it's sort of linking link soft in software to data. I mean, I, I think the cru crucial issue is could, an could another scientist, particularly in my field, but if it's designed for public access in the, pub in the public domain, could another scientist reuse my data? And if the answer is only by using some proprietary software which they can't have access to, the answer is no, they couldn't. In other yes. words, it's not open. And what slightly concerns me about the Commission's approach, which I, on one level, I applaud, because in a sense it's saying, come on, let's do this, which is great. But actually, you've got to understand what the underlying problems and issues are. And although the, under, the, or the, although the technical staff in the commission who are involved in doing this do, it's not clear to me yet that they've grasped this, that particular issue of intelligent openness, which I would say is absolutely vital. If, for example, I mean, governments worldwide have gone for open access policies with, with regard to, to uh, government data. Uh, freedom of information policies and the like, and they say sunlight is the best disinfectant, and they believe that actually it will diminish public, uh, uh, public suspicion of government. Of course, that doesn't happen. They're wrong in believing that. But nonetheless, the classic response to a freedom of information request of government is that a civil servant dumps a vast amount of data or letters on your desk, which you can't use. Um, and in other words, it's a completely wasted effort most, most of the time, and we shouldn't fall for that rather silly trick. You know, we should do it so that actually the things that we do are scrutinizable by other people. Yes, definitely, this was my point. <laughs> so thanks a lot uh, again, uh, and um, I think that we can now. <laughs> thanks. Uh,